Hello friends, welcome back to the shop. Today is Sunday, January 22nd, and it's a chilly start to the day here in southeastern Pennsylvania. 31 degrees, not too terrible, but uh, below freezing. Uh, gonna get up to a balmy 41 today, so not bad. And more reasonable January weather actually, so I can't complain. Oh boy, got, um, got a lot I want to talk about. I wish I had a tamper. Why don't I get the tamper out before I start this? I, I don't know. It's a mystery. <laughs> it's a mystery. Ah, uh, so, uh, lots going on. Lots going on. I've uh, been, been getting some shop work done this weekend, and it's been going nicely. Uh, no new pipe news in, in my pipe world. No, no new pipes, no new tobaccos today. Uh, I am enjoying this uh, little Thoravara apple billiard -y thingy. Uh, I'm pretty certain Phil calls it an apple. And uh, Haunted Bookshop. Just same old, same old, but it felt like a good morning to just be comfortable. So, yeah, I've been making nice progress with that chest of drawers I'm making. Um, and I'll show you some pictures later that kind of tie into what I want to talk about today. But I am getting ready for next weekend where I'm going to be going to the uh, Midwest Tool Collectors Association uh, York Tool Show. And I'm really looking forward to this. I have not been to this in the past. I've been a member of the, the association for uh, several years now. But I've only gone to one tool swap kind of thing, and uh, for a variety of reasons. And I'm finally going to get to one of their bigger events uh, next weekend, next Saturday. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, now you notice I used the C word there when I when I described the organization. They are a tool collectors association, and uh, it's interesting. The one, so I'm not a tool collector. Well. I might have to admit to being a tool collector. Shock. You know? I'm not a pipe collector. I'm a pipe gatherer. Remember, I have a gathering of pipes, not a collection. Collecting implies that you're not going to use the things, like you're going to put them on display or something, and I don't like that. Um, but I do have tools that I specifically bought because I liked them, I thought they were beautiful, and I have no intention of using them, mostly because I have no need for them. Now, if a need arose, I would take one of those tools off the shelf and I would use it. So it's not like I'm, you know, putting them in a museum or anything. But I do own tools that I probably will never use simply because I like them. And, uh, yeah, that's just the life of a tool collector. So I do belong to a tool collecting association, and uh, I enjoy that. I also love learning about tools and, and learning about you know the ingenuity behind them you know the how clever people were to come up with solutions to problems that they faced and it doesn't just have to be woodworking you know it can be you know the textile industry or uh, plumbing or whatever it's it's uh it's fascinating to me um i'm just i'm fascinated with 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 handwork and workmanship um which is what i've titled this video and i put a little image of pottery in the bumper because um, you know you look at that image and and if you, if you didn't pay attention to it you can imagine it's just a bunch of handmade pottery and you think boy there's something really beautiful about that and that kind of gets to this idea of workmanship so but let's stick with collecting for a minute because I, I don't, I'm getting ahead of myself so I'm going to the Tool Collectors Association um, in part because I really enjoy looking at tools and seeing the workmanship involved in producing them or how they were used. So that's a big part of it. But I'm also probably going to add a few things to my own collection. Uh, there's a couple things I need. Sorry, my phone is buzzing for some reason. A couple things I need. Uh, I've been looking for some wider uh, Stanley 750 chisels. Uh, I'd really like to get a number seven or number eight Stanley joiner plane. I, I don't have one of those, and I, that's something I would use and, and you know could make use of for sure. 
there are some things I might buy that I don't need. For example, marking gauge. Um, I highly doubt, sorry, uh, having a little technical difficulties today. I highly doubt that I would have use for a um, another marking gauge because I got me a few. And here's a picture that I will show you of a few marking gauges. This is most of my marking gauges, but not all. And uh, you see a variety there, and no, I don't use all of them. I Some of them I just have because I like them. And just to go from, from left to right there, there's the first two there are Stanley uh, marking gauges, which I occasionally use, and they're good, solid gauges. Uh, the middle one there is, is a new addition for me. It's a Marples Mortise Engage that I just got a few days ago, and I used it on a project I'm going to show you a little bit about shortly. Um, works beautifully really, really a wonderful wonderful tool the the three the last three to the right there are interesting they're all uh workman made i believe not manufactured by a company and uh they all have their charm i'm going to show you some more detail on those and then on the bottom sort of going horizontally the very bottom there's a veritas marking gauge which is a wonderful tool all metal works fantastic, highly reproducible, very accurate. And above that is a crown gauge, which is a piece of junk, but I got it. So. And those are both modern. Uh, I bought those brand new. And uh, yeah, there you have it. So the three on the left, I'm sorry, the three on the right, rather, uh, these are probably my favorite and also my least used gauges. Uh, the two on the left of this image, the darker colored ones, are both, I believe, made by the workmen. So these are shop-made tools. They're old. I, I do not know how old they are, but I would guess they are at least uh, early 19th century, perhaps even late 18th century. Uh, very well made, beautiful tools. Uh, they, the, the one on the far left works fine. I just don't use it very often. The one in the middle is a really interesting design. It's a double arm mortise and gauge with a wedge in the middle that lets you sort of lock the arms in place. It's a real pain to use. It does work, but it's a real pain to use. <laughs> I never use it. Uh, but, I, but I love it. I just love the fact that somebody sat down and made that so that they could lay out mortises in their shop. And the one on the, the far right there is, I know is shop made because I made it. Uh, that's my first marking gauge. Uh, you can see it's just a nail going through the top for a pin that I sharpened up. Um, I made that probably 25 years ago, maybe more. Uh, and I made it because I wanted to build a workbench and I didn't have a marking gauge to lay out the mortise and tenon joinery on the workbench. So my, my entire workbench is built using that marking gauge and no other uh, until I got around to starting to buy them. So yeah, uh, it's it's probably my favorite gauge and I never use it because because it's not great, but it did the job, you know, it got the job done. So let's go back to me. So yeah, I collect some tools and uh, I collect them in part because I think they're beautiful and they have a character to them that I like. I also collect them in part because I like to use them and I, again I'm not afraid to use them. So what is this idea of, of workmanship that I, that I started babbling about earlier? And you know, I'm going to talk about pipes now because <laughs> that's probably why you're watching me. You probably didn't tune in this Sunday to hear about marking gauges. and you know, so this is a Phil Rara, um, I call it a billiardy apple-y thing, not because I'm making fun of Phil, it's because I don't know pipe shapes, I'm embarrassed to say that, and um, I never remember what the maker called it, but it's pretty, it's a beautiful little pipe, and I love it, and I smoke it a lot, and it makes me happy. I got another pipe here. This is actually one that I'm fixing for my friend Rick. I don't do pipe repairs anymore as a business, but occasionally a friend needs some help and I'll 
But to give you an idea of how fast I am, I think Rick sent me this pipe in October, and yesterday I ordered the band for it. It needs a band on the shank. But this is the pipe. You're all familiar with this. It's a Bing's favorite, Sabinelli. Um, beautiful pipe. And uh, you can go and buy one of these. I can go and buy one of these. And we can put your pipe and my pipe side by side with Rick's pipe here. And they're going to all look pretty much the same. Pretty darn much identical. There'll be some differences in the rustication. But beyond that, the stems are probably going to be interchangeable on them. Um, yeah, they're going to be pretty darn close to identical. If I asked Phil to make me another Appley Billiardy type pipe, he could, and it would be equally beautiful. But it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be identical. Odds are the stems would not be interchangeable. Uh, odds are, if you put them side by side, you'd see some very obvious differences in them. And if I look at this pipe, you know, really, really carefully, I might be able to say, well, and, and I actually don't see this, but I'm, I'm just, because I don't want Phil to think I'm bad-mouthing his pipes or anything, but I could look at this and say, well, you know, there's a slight asymmetry in the bowl this way or that way or something. I, that's not true in this pipe, but, you know, you, you look at something that's handmade, you see those uh, characteristics of it that you will not see in something that's factory-made. Both smoke tobacco just fine. I own one of these too, and it's a it's a fantastic pipe. Um, so then the question comes up: Well, I can go and buy that Bing for I don't know, a hundred dollars, one hundred and fifty dollars, somewhere in that range. I haven't looked at factory pipe prices in a long time because I don't buy them anymore because I have enough. No, not because there's anything wrong with a factory pipe, I just have enough. So why is it that I'm willing to spend more than that for a Phil Rivera, for an Eric Weaver, for a Jay Mouton, uh, for, you know, Jay Allen or, or uh, Trevor Talbert or, you know, any of these makers? Why would I be willing to pay more? when I can get this and it's exactly the same. You know, I know exactly what I'm getting if I buy this. With this, I, you know, I can't order another one. It's gonna be different next time. And maybe, maybe the next, uh, the next Everson pipe that I buy, which you know, I don't have any, but uh, maybe it's gonna be a little off in some characteristic. Whereas if I buy a Savinelli for less money, a lot less in that case, uh, it's going to be absolutely dead on perfect. Why am I willing to pay more for imperfection? Let's go back to the marking gauges, if you don't mind. Just looking at these from left to right, let's ignore the two on the bottom for now. And just from left to right, you know, those two Stanleys, the first two, they're nice, they're functional, they get the job done. The marbles, Beautiful tool. Uh, this one's made out of hardwood. This is the, uh, the one in the center. But uh, other versions of this are made out of rosewood. Um, really beautiful tool with rosewood and brass and everything. And then you get the three uh, to the right, which, uh, as we mentioned, are all shop made, imperfect. If there's something about them that's just a little bit warmer than, than the first three, there's just something about them. It makes me feel better when I look at them. And then the two on the bottom are kind of cold and clinical. They're dead. Uh, they're just dead. They work. I, would, I could argue that the one on the very bottom works better than any of the others. But they're dead. If you told me I had to get rid of all of the gauges but one, and I took sentimentality out of it and didn't keep my gauge that I made, I'd probably go with that goofy double-armed mortise and gauge, the uh, second from the right, because it's just 
it's got a warmth and a character to it that is lacking in all of the others. The imperfections in it are what make it something I want to own. And that, I think, is fascinating. Uh, and what got me thinking about this is I was, uh, well, first off, I, I reread a book recently, and I've got it here. And this book is one that, you know, if you, I think it's oversighted and probably overinterpreted, but it's uh, David Pye is the nature and art of workmanship. I read this back when I was in college, when I was uh, working in the scene shop and getting really interested in, in woodworking and materials and things like that. I, I, I read this book then. It, it's got its countercultural aspects to it. I mean, it's almost a hippie-ish book in some senses. It's a fun book to read. I highly recommend it. It's a little bit, little bit academic, so it's not like a quick, you know, not something you would want to read on the beach, but if you're at all interested in in workmanship and, and quality and uh, handcrafting, it, it's a great book. And what got me thinking about this topic is I was out to dinner with my wife uh, last week, and we were at Iron Hill Brewery, and there was a coaster. And the coaster read, For the Love of Craft. And I took a picture, because when I go out and get a beer, I take a picture of it and put it on Instagram, because the world needs to know what beer I'm drinking. And the coaster was in the picture, and I commented that if the coaster said, For the Love of Work, I would take it home. Or I might have said, For the Love of Workmanship, I would take it home. That was an inside joke that was so inside that I'm the only person that got it. And it was related to David Pye's book, which I had just finished, uh, like maybe two weeks prior. Because Pai argues that craftsmanship is non-existent, that it's a poorly defined term that doesn't mean anything. Uh, he argues that what we should be saying is workmanship, that it's, there's no such thing as craft. It just doesn't mean anything. Work, we know what work is, and we know good work and we know bad work. But then there's this interesting area where we look at something like handmade pottery or handmade marking gauges or anything, and we say, that's not to the same exactness and standard as this factory-made thing, but I like it more. I find it more attractive. I find it more warm and alive. And, you know, why is that? And he defines two types of workmanship, and this is where it's been very overinterpreted by the internet, but that's okay. Um, he defines something called uh, the workmanship of risk, and the other one, I forget the term he uses, but let's just say the workmanship of exactness. He has a different term for it. It'll come to me. So on the exactness side, you're using jigs and, and power tools, and, and, and you're you're making things to high standards with very accurate um, measuring capabilities. They're made with a high degree of accuracy and precision. The workmanship of risk, you're using hand tools, you're, you're carving, you're, you're shaping with your hand. You don't have that jig to make sure you're at exactly a 90 degree angle. You might measure it afterwards and check, but there's risk involved. You might cut off just a little bit too much wood when you when you when you're planing down a board. Uh, you might make your chip a little bit too big when you're carving, and when you're putting lines in the pottery, maybe the spacing between the first line and the second line is not exactly where it's supposed to be. But that leads to a beauty that cannot be captured by a machine-made object. Pretty cool to think about it that way. So forget about craftsmanship and artisanal whatever. It's work. It's workmanship. And there's good workmanship and bad workmanship. And you can get good workmanship done by a machine, and you can get good workmanship done by hand. Uh, and he goes really deep into this and says, you know, even the, the tools that you're using to make the exact things in a factory, where did they come from? At some level, the workmanship of risk had to be used to create that tool. It, there's no other way that it could have existed. 
everything at some level has some of that workmanship or risk associated with it. Yeah, it's. I just think it's interesting to think about that in the context of things like pipes, where, you know, again, there's this difference between these two things. And uh, I'm at a point where I'm babbling now. <laughs> I had some pictures of, of some mortise and tenon joints, and I was going to talk more about exactness versus... It, it, you get my point. <laughs> you get my point. So the next time you, you see something that's beautiful and handmade, pay attention to the... I hate to say flaws, but that's what they are. Pay attention to the inexactness and, and the, what it is that draws your eye to that thing. If somebody made something absolutely perfect so that you couldn't distinguish it from something that was made by a machine, would it be as beautiful as somebody that did a slightly less perfect job? Well, that's that. So what am I doing today? Not a lot. I did a lot of work yesterday. I'm pretty much ready to assemble the carcass on the, uh, well, I'm ready to cut the joinery in the carcass. So I got to cut dados into the side to hold the drawer shelves. And I got to cut the dovetails at the top to uh, fix the top to the sides. And then I can glue that up and start making the drawers. So yeah, we're getting there. And uh, getting that last drawer frame done yesterday was a big deal. And, uh, but yeah, I'm kind of tired today, so I don't think I'm going to do much. Take a day off. It's Sunday after all. Finish my pipe. Have some more coffee, which I've been neglecting and is probably now cold. And rest up for the work day tomorrow. So with that, folks, I'm going to draw this uh, particularly rambly thing to a close. I hope you got the... The main point of what I was trying to say and you know let me know give me your thoughts uh, give me your thoughts on workmanship and you know, factory versus handmade and, and those sorts of things why are we willing to pay more for something that is arguably not as well made in terms of precision and exactness should we value that precision and exactness more or is there something about the flawed nature of what we make by hand that makes it more valuable to us. Let me know your thoughts. I'd be interested. Well, with that, friends, I will call this to a close. I hope you all have a wonderful Sunday and a great week ahead. And until we speak again, I will look forward to talking to you all again very soon. Goodbye now. Mm -hmm.